Well, thanks for staying with us on the Tuesday edition of our flagship program. It's time to get talking as we need to lend our thoughts, comments, and conversations to critical issues as make headline coverage. Be reminded that the news headlines are read as published according to the guidelines of the different media outlets. Now, one of the challenging developments is with the projections for the economy vis-a-vis -vis the NBC reports as published. Well, before we look at the newspapers this morning, permit me to introduce my in-house guest, uh, Saola Milekon Adifolari. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for having me. Good morning to all of you out there. Now, let's quickly pay attention to all the developments as captured on the frontline pages as President Bola Metinibu is hopeful for a stronger economic performance and a GDP growth. Now, this is captured on three papers this morning as headline features on the Daily Times, the Nation newspaper, and the Blueprint, you'd find this headline story. Now, let's begin with the Daily Times this morning, leading those three group of papers that have comments about Nigeria's economic performance. You'd find the catchphrase, GDP growth. Tinibu assures stronger economic performance, says FG will continue to work assiduously to rekindle Nigeria's hope and confidence, appoints new director generals of NIA, DSS. Now, on the right of the Daily Times, you'll find three feature stories. CBN raises deposit rates to 25.75% for banks as SLF suspense, uh, suspension ends. We increase passport fees to enhance quality, faster process, says NIS. A bill court voids judgment faulting Edo PDP governorship primary. While on the Nation newspaper, very similar to the headline story you'd find on the Daily Times newspaper. As it reads, Tinibu, GDP search points to an economy on right path. Tinibu, GDP search points to an economy on right path. Now, joining these two papers is a third paper as well with a lead focus on the economic projections and comments coming in from President Bola Metinibu. We find this captured on the blueprint. On the blueprint, it reads, Tinibu excited as GDP raises to 3.19% Q2. Service sector drives non-oil growth. Waleke identifies CBN rate hike. High petroleum products as reasons. Now, and from the economic perspective, uh, let's get the the balance here. It, it may seem as though at a time when Nigerians are grappling with harsh economic realities, exactly. it, it may seem as though the economy on its projections look to be uh, having a ton of faith. Definitely, it will because people are spending. People are spending so much in terms of how to cover up with their daily expenses. People are spending so much in terms of how to cover up with their occupational costs. And people are spending so much because there is an increase in every sector of the economy in terms of price, in terms of production costs, and the rest of them. So for me, we, don't, we should not look at, this, at the GDP report from the surface. We look at the Benin. What is the Benin? The Benin is the, the entire total real GDP count in terms of the money, in terms of how much that has been accrued within the last three months that make up the second quarter of the 2024 that we are in, about 18.98 trillion naira altogether have been so spent, has gone around the entire economy in the last three months. What does it tell you? So a lot of money have gone into production, a lot of money are going to expenses, a lot of money are going into buying and selling, a lot of money are going to, you know, a microeconomic aspect of household, spending so much to be able to cater for their well-being. And that is what the GDP is trying to tell us from the real aspect of it. But on the surface of it, is to look at the contribution of each of the sectors that contributed so much to the GDP. And wide vote has come from the service sector. And the service sector include the financial sector, the trading sector, the transportation sector, the entertainment sector, as well as the ICT sector. And the ICT sector remained the largest contributor, talking about information communication and communication sector, remained the largest sector contributing to the GDP as a whole. But to also break this information down for ordinary people to understand and for us to also complain is that it talks about the entire growth of many products, talking about the production sector of the economy in the last three months. And it is all about the money that exchange and within the three months or 90 days or four months, four months there about of the second quarter of 2024. So it, it shows that the Nigerian economy is growing in terms of how much people are putting 
in the economy, spending on the operational production, but how much does it come back to the people? And that's what we need to also find out going forward in this discussion. Now, we're told by the National Bureau of Statistics mm. that uh, the economy has grown by 3.9% mm. year on year mm. in the second quarter of the year. You've told us some of the spendings and how this contributed to the GDP. Exactly. And a stronger projection for our economic outlook. Exactly. Now, the, the challenge here is mm. whilst this increased spending is said to mm -hmm. be faced by the current economic crisis, mm. many households are said to spend a larger chunk of their income mm. on consumption. Definitely. Uh, what, what does this entail for our production economy? Definitely because in the consumption aspect of microeconomy of household, uh, the value of the currency is very low compared to where it was some few years ago. And most money that many households are spending, they are spending thrice of what they're supposed to spend on a particular product. Let's say two, three years ago, what you are spending on sugar, you are spending like four times of it at this point in time. So it consumes your earning and whatever you are bringing in as in terms of money, cash that you are earning. Then on the aspect of our production, now the production is not as much as what we wanted because Nigerian economy is an import dependent economy. Sugar that I've been mentioned right now is still largely imported even though it is being still product, produced here in Nigeria, but largely imported into the economy. What is also tell us that in terms of productivity, in terms of we producing for the economy to really generate employment, to really generate price stability, because there are two things that we must look outside the GDP. What has happened to employment? What has happened to price stability? These two things are missing in our GDP calculation, although it's not, it's not related to it. But in real terms of how to understand the productivity of a nation, once these two things are missing, price stability and employment generation, then there's a problem. And that's what we are lacking. So when these two are lacking, households will suffer because most of the product they are consuming is still import dependent. The sugar that we are still consuming in the family is still import dependent. The milk is still import dependent. The rice is still import dependent. Everything that household on the microeconomy side is consuming is still import dependent. So they must spend much because the value of the currency is very very depreciating and what they are spending at this point is that it's four times three times five times of what they are spending from some few years ago so those are the challenges that we have it so in as much as i want to explain this gdp growth that the president is celebrating is excited though the other aspect of it is that in terms of relating it to ordinary life it's still far far from it but we can see from the figure from the entire look it is exciting but when you now relate it and translate it into appreciable a, a reality of what Nigerians are facing is far, far from it. As I already pointed out, two things are missing from GDP. What has happened to price stability and what has happened to employment generation? Now, talking price stability, on one of these papers, a setting trader reported that mm. he made 7 million naira mm. in one year growing tomatoes. Mm. Now, the price stability of tomatoes as a case study has exactly. been fluctuating Very well. year, year on year. Mm. Now, in terms of the concerns you have, mm. Another projection is for the service sectors. Mm. The service sector linked to this NBC report is one of the, the sectors that is thriving Very owing well. to these projections as mm. well. Mm. So help us get perspective of some of this out, as outlined in the NBC report. For, for instance, the service sector, as earlier mentioned, include transportation, ICT, information, communication, and telecommunication, entertainment. It also includes health, uh, uh, health sector, education sector is also part of it, financial sector is also part of it. Now, if you look at all the sectors I've mentioned, there are more than six or seven of them. They have been contributing in terms of the services they are offering to Nigerians. But in the way of offering these services, the price of all of them has also gone up in terms of what they collect in terms of offering their services for you. And they also relate that to the operational cost of them offering you these services. Take, for instance, transportation. I, I saw the, uh, the, the highlight of Professor Oleke, one of the leading Nigerian financial capitalists, talking about because of the high cost of energy, transportation costs have increased. It's very, very correct in terms. Talk about PMA, talk about diesel, talk about aviation fuel, they also talk about the air transportation and the rest of them, including sea transportation. The cost of operating transport is very high. So definitely the contribution of transportation sector in the service sector in the Nigerian GDP must be because they are recouping a lot of money from what uh, uh, end users of transportation is paying. At the same time, they're also spending much to provide those services in terms of the operational costs. That is on the transportation sector. Now, the entertainment sector is also providing services for Nigerians. You are going to the show, you are going to cinema, you are going to a uh, bookshop to go and one entertainment. You are also paying for those services. In the running of those services or providing those services to end users, to cinema, 
uh, people that are coming to watch films and the rest of them, you are also going to incur a lot of cost in that regard. They are going to pay for energy in terms of fueling their generators or providing, uh, paying for artists and the rest of them that come. So all those are also added to the GDP in the area of cost. Because one thing that also we must not forget out of the GDP issue is that in as much as we are, fund is generated, money is being generated, that money is also is being expended to grow the economy through expenses, through operational costs and the rest of them. The another sector we have also look at is the area of uh, ICT. And the, our Nigerian ICT is also import dependent. Most of the ICT product that we are consuming is also import dependent. You see that ICT provider through the national and the network, provide, uh, network service provider, telecommunication, the rest of them. Most of the equipment they are using, even the technical S party SQ they are using, is also imported. So they are also paying in that regard. So from these three set, uh, service sector, sub, sub sector of the service sector I've mentioned, you can see that in as much as they are providing services for people who are consuming, who are the end user, the people consuming those products are paying three times or four times or what would have been some years back for that service and they on their part the service provider are also paying so much in terms of operational cost of what they are using to get those service provided for Nigeria particularly those ones that are import dependent because of the naira volatility exchange rate volatility they are paying so much for custom duty as well as exchange rate or, or either on the NAFEX platform or the NAFEM platform on the Nigerian foreign exchange market now, this is uh, some of the projections, vis-a-vis comments and pledges made by President Bola Metinibas convened by his special advisor on information and strategy, Mr. Bayo Nanuga, who says President Bola Metinibu has expressed excitement at the growth in the nation's GDP in the second quarter of the year 2024 by 3.17%. Now, this has also been linked to the need for our currency to be strengthened by Mr. Adefo Larin, saying that uh, it does not genuinely reflect the position of the Nigerian populace as against the demographics of those benefiting the most from increases in the service sector and, of course, in our production economy. Now, in moving on to another worrying development as published by the Daily Trust newspaper this morning, the front-line story reads that 21 states seek 1.65 trillion naira loans despite a 40% rise in FAC revenue. Let's take a look at the front page publication of the Daily Trust newspaper. Now, you'd find the lead story beneath the masthead. 21 states seek 1.65 trillion naira loans despite 40% raise in FAC revenues, 7.6 trillion naira released to states, LGs in one year, 20% of June allocation, enough to build 320 primary health care centers. Experts urge accountability. The Daily Trust also does the uh, generosity of providing an infographics to back their publication. It says what states local government received as FAC allocations in post-subsidy errors. And then you have a breakdown from the month of June 2023 to the month of July 2024. Now, Zamfara, Kanu, Kaduna, Kwara are states that have been highlighted with deep blue are states with a viable IGR that can sustain themselves without FAC, whilst the states in sky blue, which are largely more of the states leading fresh loans, 21 of them, are states that are reliant on FAC allocation and disbursements. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Defolarin, this mm. is one of the genuine concerns. Exactly. That despite an increase in the post-subsidy era, mm. 21 states need mm. 1.65 trillion naira mm. to sustain themselves. Definitely. We, we keep talking about how to support <laughs> internally generated revenue in these exactly, states. Exactly. Uh, it almost feels like uh, paperwork mm. when we cannot achieve it in actuality. Uh, the reason why they can't achieve it because they don't have the concrete strategy to get those business-like investments in the state. Most states who are trying as much as possible to improve their idea are still they have identified areas that it is not just collecting taxes, collecting fees that it is the most genuine way of generating revenue there are other means of investing investing the state resources in things that can also bring up more money for the state that's what most of the state are lacking then on this issue of most of them looking for loans we can see that if we go back to what has happened to the nigerian state in terms of what they are getting and what they have been able to acquire over the years most of the states are still debt ready they are owing a lot of loans and most times when their loans are being services, it is from the FAC allocation that most of those loan money are being removed. 
So by the time the arrests come to the state, it is very few in millions of billions of naira that come to the state that could not take care of, at least majorly, the will bill of the state. Will bill of the state is the salaries and movement of political appointees and civil servants in the state. That cannot even be taken care of because of what is coming. So it is not just because the problem started today. The problem have been there for a very long time, particularly states that go into debt, borrowing money for things that could not even expressly showcase as what they have done with the money. And that's why they're having that challenge. And now they are going for another loan. 1.65 trillion naira to be able to cater for the needs of the state. It also shows that because they are not being very accountable for what they have been generating and they are not being very prudent in the money they have been getting to be able to fix into development purposes. And if a state doesn't put money in development purposes, there is no way investors will be attracted to your state. Most of the states still lack motorable good roads in their state. Most of them still lack you know, infrastructure that will support the economy of the state to grow. And if you look at some of the state GDP, it is quite quite interesting that state has very laudable GDP on paper. But how to tap into the GDP of those states are very, very challenging. And what I mean, what do I mean by that? Take for instance a state like Niger State that have resources that could be built into, that could be buy into. But because the state has not yet been able to map out how to project the state economy blueprint in a way that could be very attractive. And when I say blueprint, I'm not talking about written on paper. In terms of concrete evidence that okay this state is doing very very well in this particular aspect of the economy and that would have been a very long way to show that investors can also be attracted and to be interested it is just so recently that niger state woke up from slumber and began to invest in agriculture whereby the state now said okay they want to own farms ah which other state can also borrow this idea because one of the leading investment that is very affordable very you no know, not cheap per se but very affordable and very accessible is for state to go into food production and with food production, it can attract industries with, within your state. T talking food production, Mr. Olami Lekon, when, when you look at that infographics, mm. which we had the pleasure of seeing from mm. the Daily Trust, you find out that a large number of these 21 states mm. are Algerian states mm. in the Middle Belt, mm -hmm. captured in a light blue, mm -hmm. are states like Kogi, mm -hmm. Benue, mm -hmm. Nasarawa, mm -hmm. Plateau, mm. Taraba, where you would expect that going to the large arable lands. Exactly. They will be able to benefit from this sustainable food production like you have called for. Mm. But issues bordering on insecurity continue mm. to be one of the hampering factors. Mm. Is it the political will that is mm. lacking? Or what is indeed is the challenge with achieving sustainability for states through increased IGR? Definitely, we cannot rely the problem of insecurity. But I don't want us to armor too much. Insecurity is really, I've profiled on this, uh, on this platform before that we can have city centers farm. That will also enhance food production. It's not necessary to go into the bush or into the far interland to go and establish farm before we know they want to produce. We can establish farm within the sub region of the urban centers and the rest of them. But the key challenge is their political will is not there and the economic will is not there. I will explain this economy. When I mean economic will, I'm talking about if you remember you will spend 10 naira today and get a value of 15 naira tomorrow. You will not spend that 10 naira today. You will wait till tomorrow to spend 15 naira and will get lesser value for that money. And that's the challenge that we're having in Nigeria, particularly from the sub-national like state and local government. They don't know how to put their money investment area that could help them to generate. When I'm mentioning food production, food production is very key because most of the industrial cotton industry that we are having in Nigeria, whether in the food and beverage sector, they need food materials. They need food, uh, uh, cash crop materials, maize, corn, beans, millet and the rest of them to add to the production of food that we are having. Majority of us consume uh, spag. Spag is from cassava, another uh, food uh, crop material. So if states are producing all this material for industry, what stop a company not to establish is a, a, an, a factory that we produce spag in a particular state? All the spag that we all consume in the entire north central to all parts of the country comes from Lagos. Most of them are situated in Lagos. So when we produce some of those agricultural food products, they take it to Lagos before those companies now bring it back. Why well, I wish the state can understand this particular on, uh, uh, strategy and begin to produce food. And when I talk about food, I'm not just talking about food that could just be consumed on a street food, like fruit oranges. No, I'm talking about food that can also be processed into from primary to secondary and tertiary production. And the raw material can also feed industries. Just two, two weeks back, I talked about leather. There's a sister station that invited me to talk about leather production. And I discovered that state governments are also shying away from animal owns boundary. And there's a good value for animal owns boundary in terms of export of leather, uh, leather as well as the production of leather for shoes, bags, and belts locally. But most of the leather that we see that produce in Nigeria are exported. But because there is no means of 
using them for local production. But we are all saying that we need a strategic means of food production as well as aspect of food production that will lead to industrialization of every state. So that in, in terms of IGL, IGL can come from that angle. You are selling your product from the food item you have farmed. You are also getting taxes and fees you are collecting from factories that have established in your state. But they are lacking because most of the state governors are not interested in such concrete aspect of a policy economy. Now, this policy economy you speak about, mm. we looked at the Ajao Kuta Steel Company a couple mm. of months back. Mm. Despite the current efforts on grounds to revitalize it, exactly. it still remains bourbon, mm. more bond. Mm. There are also rumors that some persons are still drawing salaries from the Ajao Kuta Steel Company. Mm. There are electricity bills all that are yet to be settled as well mm. from the Ajao Kuta Steel Company. Now, mm. there are a lot of other more bond steel com companies uh, and other companies across Nigeria. Mm. The challenge now becomes on, is it that the funds sunk into revitalize these uh, factories are not enough, mm. or that there is a lack of raw materials to keep them running? Definitely, it's, it's all multifaceted issues. Raw material is not there, the fund is not enough. But I'm one of the economists that always say that there is no, there's never be a time you have enough money to run a business. There will never be a time you have a money to run a country. Any money that you found, any money that is given to you, make use of it judiciously and you have a result and more money will come but in our own case we always talk about more money more money like Ajakuta you talk about before Ajakuta was generating his own electricity by himself the entire Ajakuta community that you see where that industry is situated they generate electricity by themselves the water by themselves everything by themselves but all of a sudden because of the lack of government focus and foresight and vision about that particular gigantic industrial sector they it was left in a, in a limbo but we just hope that the revival policy of the government about revamping this age-long industry will come to fruition but there are political interests there are economic interests there are also international external interests about it and we also have some sabotaging elements in our country that doesn't want that company to start because of importation of iron oil and metal uh, pack, uh, uh, product across other parts of the world because if a jakuta start just the way the nfpc a refinery, NFPC refinery is not working, or there, are, there is a tangle between NFPC and Dagote. The same thing we also have with Ajakuta. Bet me, if Ajakuta is revived today, we may also have the same contention with iron or importers. Either construction companies who will also deny that they don't want to buy that product, or Nigerian importer of iron or they will say they don't want to buy that product from that particular angle because they may consider it to be inferior. So these are the challenges we normally have. But the national policy around it to revamp it. To ensure that we buy into the interest that will become a national interest and security of Nigerian economy, we need to forge ahead and make sure that we bring it to pass. But on the issue of the challenges around it, we know we can surmount those challenges. The funding is not a problem. If money has been released for that particular project, let us see the result of what has been released. There was a time over 200 billion was said to have been released for Jakarta. Nobody heard about it. And the reason why we don't hear about the money is because that money went into salaries and pension payment of staffs who were working there at the point that of today, and those who will retire. So when money comes into that kind of sector, definitely the MD or whoever is managing will want to settle all the outstanding bills that is being owed. Then the money that's supposed to go into the production will be lacking. But I just hope that at a one go, government can tackle some of these challenges that we're having in Jakarta, so that a Nigerian can breathe, a Jakarta can breathe, and iron, oil, and metal can be produced. Because one of the greatest advantages of Jakarta is that the moment it starts functioning, just like the oil sector, we are hoping that the final will function. Then the the, the forest we spend on importation of iron ore will also reduce because we are spending a lot of forex in terms of importation of iron ore. We are just very quiet about that aspect of the economy just because uh, oil and gas has been a major issue that we don't talk about. Oil and gas have been eating up our forest. Now we are no more talking about oil and gas eating up our forest again, although NFPs have made us understand it is still eating our forest because most of the exchange rate volatility is affecting what we now call uh, subsidy in local terms. Now, in its post-subsidy era discussions, and Mr. Defolari Olami Lekon has preferred some solutions which he says is more viable in finding state sustainabilities. As the Daily Trust newspaper reports, the 21 states in Nigeria are seeking fresh loans to the tune of 1.65 trillion naira, despite a 40% rise in FAC revenue. Now, and some of these states are also largely agrarian. And he's talked about the fact that agriculture is more sustainable and states need to invest in city farmsteads where insecurity would not be a problem and the siting of certain factories that thrive on some of the most arable and available staple foods in Nigeria, like cassava, that can be directly generating spaghetti and other noodles. 
is one of those key drivers that the country needs to begin to take into consideration. Now, another newspaper greeting our discourse this morning is the Leadership Newspaper. And on its front page are reports about the rejig as instituted by President Bola Metinibu in the NIA and DSS. There's been some leadership reshuffling. Let's take a look at the Leadership Newspaper this morning. On the Leadership Newspaper this morning, you'd find the lead story, Insecurity. Waves of change as Tinibu rejigs NIA DSS. Mohammed replaces Rufai. Ajayi takes over from Bichi. Experts set new agenda for new DGs. Now, I don't know if you're also preview to the video that has now gone viral on social media yesterday mm. uh, following the resignation of the DSS DG. Mm. It was reported that some uh, members of staff mm. uh, began to throw parties within the work premise celebrating the resignation of the DG. DG. Now, away from that viral video, mm. uh, this reshufflement is normal in the scope definitely, of definitely. Uh, the beat to tackle and combat insecurity, mm. but that body language from the staff on the one hand and this new agenda setting for the new DJs, what do you make of it? I think it's very interesting, very interesting in terms of the DSS, for instance, uh, a lot of the staff, they are, they are a little bit weary of the, the DJ that resigned. You know, it was left off hook of the job some years back, but was brought back by uh, President Buhari to replace Dawara, the, the Dawara that many people were very, very uh, angry with because of the way of a manner that he operated then as DJ of DSS. Then uh, Bichi, Bichi was brought back, who has, has gone to retirement some years back, but was brought back by Buhari and he served almost like four, I mean six years on, the, on, on that particular position. So a lot of the staff will be wary about him, that he, someone that was retired before, they now brought him back. And uh, a lot of them also see opportunity that uh, maybe he brought the old block of uh, how security should be done in the DSS into play. So for him to have been left hook of the job right now, it calls for solution among the staff who believe that uh, there will be opportunity for career movement in the service, uh, which has really happened, whereby the new appointee was an assistant director general of the service uh, that has now been appointed. So it's a good one for them. But we just hope that they are, from the agenda setting they are putting up is to ensure that whatever these other people have left undone, or whatever mistake these other guys have not been able to correct or done on their own, these new people that have been appointed should be able to put proactiveness in providing professionalism and ethical security services for Nigeria. Because one of the challenges that we have in our security architecture is that even though we see, see them as professionals, but that ethical aspect is also missing. That's why you see that a lot of people are complaining about Nigerian police, Nigerian military, how they undo civilians. So we just want professionalism and ethical processes to be injected. Although all the agenda will focus on how to uh, tackle insecurity. insecurity. But for me, that professional and ethical processes should also be there so that how you relate with the civilian population is also very, very important. How you jump into issues that doesn't have to involve you as a DSS, going to look for issues about land, people quarreling over land, or people quarreling over money, that shouldn't be the work of DSS. Or N Although we understand the NIA is well known to be that you don't hear much, you, don't, you only hear them, but you don't see them because they work overseas. And they are like the Nigerian exponage uh, service sector. If you understand, they're the one that, 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 that the spy agency of the Nigerian state to help them to spy on other countries across the world. That is their major work. You get it. To also that they can give feedback information of what a particular country, a supposed or suspected enemy of Nigeria is doing or is planning. That's what the work of NIA and to protect all our embassy and mission across the world. That is their work. Now, talking about this ethical reorientation in the doings and activities of the DSS, particularly mm -hmm. even in relationship with sister agencies. Mm -hmm. The DSS over time has come under some media scrutiny. Exactly. Uh, quite prominently during the MFLA gates. Exactly. The scuffle with uh, correctional service agents and beyond that, even the clash with uh, the EFCC in Lagos mm -hmm. in broad yeah. daylight. Yeah. Exactly. Now, now, these scuffles that continue to rear their ugly heads, mm -hmm. do you think it's a function of the head of such agencies or is it an issue in the moral fabrics of the staff and officers under the employment you, of the DSS. We can't rule out the moral fabric issue, we can't rule out the ethical issue. But I will give you a typical example. When the two areas in Kanu were fighting, a particular area went back to the state with armies. Army. And the information we got to know was that the chief of the army staff never knew about the set, the two soldiers that followed him, the chief of uh, defense staff never knew. They all sent those guys to follow him. 
there was finger at the or at the office of national security advisor that he must have been the one that have ordered those military to follow the particular emir so it could be as he runs that we normally see local parlance runs for the particular general or a major general or a particular brigadier to have some boys and have a relationship with people that can also use his influence to influence a particular issues or a particular mission to favor his friends and others so that could be so but what i trying to point out in as much as this will be exhibiting or this will be existing we don't want that to happen and affect the fabric of nigerian security architecture because the the, the scuffle that you had between nigerian prison service and the dss was as a result of court pronouncement that the man should remain in prison should be reminded in prison. Now, the court did not say either in Nigerian Correctional Service Prison or the DSS Service Prison. You, you know, say DSS have their cell. Nigerian Correctional Service also have. I wish the court have said, okay, let it remind, be reminded in the cell of DSS. There won't be any scuffle. But because the judge did not make that mention, the two agencies were now after the man. I'm the one that brought this man to court. The court have said, okay, take this man back to the prison. So, who should be the responsibility to not take the mandate? I think that world really caused that misunderstanding between the jump uh, correctional services and DSS. Because we know that it was DSS that took him to court. He has been in the of the DSS for a very long time. But because the court said, let him be reminded in, in prison, so he now bring a conflict. Then the one that happened between the EFCC and the DSS was as a result of a building. You know, before we have the DSS in place, there was what we call National Security Agency. Then, in the 80s, it was that National Security Agency that transformed into the DSS. That we have today that particular building on on um, Boli, uh, by body Lawn road in ikoi belong to the dss and for a long time ESS has been occupying that particular building and you no know, notice memo have been sent that they should uh, vacate. vacate that particular premises and they did not go or they did not leave that uh, by that particular premises but the dg of dss in i mean the director of dss was in i think they are in request to make use of that building and that's why i said and when the question was asked does the DSA DG in Abuja knew about this scuffle between DSS and the FCC? The report was there was miscommunication. So, in other words, apart from bringing about professionalism, apart from ensuring that the, the, the ethical process is also installed, we also need concrete information, con information that will not be um, will not be break by any barrier, a free flow information communication between all these security agencies and their sister agencies that are not even security or maybe paramilitary or power security agencies so they can work in harmony so apart from professionalism apart from ethical processes we also need effective communication that will not be broken or be hindered by any means now an interesting development with the uh the stories that greet the frontline pages remember that you two are not left out you can share your thoughts comments and opinions reacting to a news coverage on our newspaper review segments now, in keeping with more newspapers, uh, it's also one of the pressing issues that continues to affect the Nigerian state, and it's with the hike in the pump price of premium motor spirits, popularly known as petrol. This morning, the Punch newspaper reports that the federal government is moving to clamp down on errant filling stations. Now, many would recall that the NNPC had set a price template post subsidy. Now, the challenge is that this price template for Nigerians to be, obtained, to be able to obtain PMS is now not being followed. Now, let's look at the Punch newspaper as we look at this story more in-depthly. Now, on the Punch newspaper this morning, you'd find the lead story. FG to short errant fuel stations as petrol hits 1,000 naira per liter. FG to short errant fuel stations as petrol hits 1,000 naira per liter. Queues persists. In NNPCL, major marketer stations as PMS shortage worsens. Now, this is one of those stories mm -hmm. that we have debated upon for exactly. quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Logistic challenges have been blamed. Mm -hmm. The rainy seasons have been blamed. Mm -hmm. The state of the roads have been blamed. Definitely. Uh, th there's been a lot of blames thrown mm -hmm. back and forth, but mm -hmm. the challenge is we continue to see lingering fuel shortage in exactly. Nigeria. Exactly. Now, if at designated filling stations is 1,000 naira. Mm -hmm. Then at the black market, we know that it is above 1,500. It's even going to 2,000 naira in some places. Mm -hmm. And one of the missing challenges that the oil marketers are not talking about now is that uh, they, are short, they don't have dollar to go and import. They are not talking about that. But the other challenges, logistic, uh, bad road nature, as well as the uh, rainy season, they always main mention that. But for me, uh, for the government to say they want to clamp down on the air filling station, is for them to also look at what they have been doing over the years or what have been look, doing over the months in terms of how to ensure that we have 
free flow supply to all filling stations. And that goes back to uh, the depot aspect. With the depot owners, what they are doing. Because before you close down any filling station, first look at the activities of depot owners. Where these tankers normally go and pick the fuel from before they now transport it to every other corners and creams of the country. Because if you don't charge the depot owners who are also doing one or two increases on the uh, S depot price, definitely the, the, the filling station will continue to use this opportunity to increase the prices. And again, there's this nature and character of the oil sector in Nigeria, particularly the transportation, particularly uh, the normal language, the normal use, the downstream sector of the petroleum sector. Nobody's looking at diversion of this product. Although we talk about the smuggling of this product out of the country, there's also a nature of diversion within the Nigerian uh, uh, country per se. And I'll give you a typical example. Why does the diversion happen? Now, if a particular tanker will pick a product meant for Abuja, then on the highway as it's coming, there are agents who normally stand on the highway, who, who, who normally wave down those tankers and begin to give them pricing that could be very, very, you know, very enticing per se. As we speak right now, a, a 45,000 liter of fuel, uh, or, or tank, fuel tanker is about over 35 million naira, and about above 35 million naira. Now, if a diversion agent is offering you 50 million, 60 million, what will you do? And they contact the manager of that village, what will they do? They will definitely go, will buy into it. And diversion will also bring about high cost of some of this port. Because in the come, if you come to the city centers, where you see where the station is selling above, 720, 750, 800, 900. It is because they didn't buy it directly from the depot. They also get what they, they engage in diversion product, which they now bring to their filling station. And they have spent so much for it. So when they spend so much to bring a diverted product into their filling station, they will definitely want to recoup their money. So we must work on the depot price, and depot price. Then we must also put a planning to checkmate diversion of this product, even within the Nigerian. Uh, 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 territory because we normally focus on the smuggling, but diversion is also crippling the oil and gas sector whereby we are now having an increase in prices because most of those filling stations that doesn't have licenses or even including those ones that have licenses, they are also operating through diversion. They are also getting their product through diversion as a result of because by the time they get diversion product, they will sell it more high and they will recoup their money also very very high. So we must look at diversion. We also look at exitable price to help before we now clamp down on filling station that are selling on a very high exorbitant prices. Now, this is one angle of the conversation, exactly. and I very much agree with you. Mm. But now, when we look at it from the root cause of this challenge, mm. many talk about getting our refineries back on track. Definitely, we can't do that. Out. Dangote has given the promise of October mm. to roll out PMS. This Definitely. promise was formally in June. June. Mm -hmm. The goalposts almost seems to keep shifting, mm -hmm. and many are pointing to some of what we call the cabals that have mm -hmm. made it quite difficult mm. in getting even Dangote that started production to mm. be able to churn out PMS. Mm. Are there hopes that Potakot Refinery and the Worry Refinery can surmount those challenges that Dangote is facing to be able to afford Nigerians fill at a cheaper landing cost? Definitely. They, they are government-owned refineries, so they will be able to sell at a government-owned price. Even as we speak today, the NMPC filling station outlet that is selling at 617, 640 and the rest of them. NIPCO is still selling at over... 720 and the rest of it. So those government owned filling stations are still selling at a price that people can still afford without making too much noise. But we must understand that Angote is a private business. And you also want to recoup the money that you use in building the refinery. That is one. Then also, Dangote for me as an economy, I have been able to analyze what is happening. Not that you cannot release those products at a very affordable price. It's also looking at the volatility of the price on international scale. The price of crude on international scale, what is being sold on the international market. So he's also looking at that. And also looking at the body language of Nigerian oil marketers, whether they are even very interested in picking his product. Because at that point in time, he's looking at a product whereby when he releases his product, his product will not be also inf I mean, impacted with smuggling. Because we must also look at that. Because by the time Dangote fill the entire Nigerian market with his product, I hope smuggling will not affect that product, whereby it will not be that it's really that the one that lost after affording Nigerian a very cheap PMS. So we must also look at that. But because he's a businessman, we want to recoup his money and also look at the strategic implication of government policy in this oil and gas sector. If the refinery comes on screen, the Potakot and the world comes on screen, all oh, about his product. Although his own target is not the Nigerian market, but entire West Africa and Central Africa. But he's also looking at this point in time, he wants to be patriotic enough to give the product to Nigeria. But in giving the product to Nigeria, can he quickly recoup his money within a time frame? There's, he has also set for his product to be released into the market. So the June, uh, the June, it was even June that he said he's going to release the product, but he released the other product like the aviation fuel, diesel, 
and you look at the market volatility, market uncertainty, and what really happened within that period. You also look at the body language and propaganda in the media about this product and the acceptance of the product. You need to look at that. And again, if you now release the PMS, you hope that you will not also suffer the same media propaganda you suffer during the release of the diesel as well as aviation for it to Nigerian economy. But uh, for me, it's, it's for him to just think strategically and help Nigerian market situation because Nigerian market is the biggest market they can rely on. If you send this product to other countries, the government of that country, their policy could also affect this product. So Nigerians will remain where it can also quickly launch this product and the Nigerian market is very, very welcoming to accept this product going forward. Now, talking about importing fuel into the mm. country, the NNPCL, despite being the sole importer of fuel, has mm. given out licenses to certain players in the downstream sector. Mm. Besides the smuggling allegations, mm. they are also issues of adulterated fuel exactly. where we saw the leadership of the national assembly under the senate president got mm. talk about the need for the committee to be set up mm. to look into cases of adulterated fuel in the nigerian market yes. a couple of days ago another video went viral of a fuel attendant in a said filling station pumping mere air into the tanks of mm. unsuspecting customers who came to buy fuel mm. beyond setting up a committee are there other modalities nigeria can explore in checkmating some of these infractions in the mm. downstream sector, be it adulterated fuel mm -hmm. or be it sharp practices on mm -hmm. the part of petrol attendants. Definitely, let's start with sharp practices by petrol attendants. What is the work of Ipman? Do they have tax force on their own to ensure that their members comply with best standard, you know, well regulated standard that could also ensure that customers get the best out of the market? I don't think that is in place. Most times that you see Ipman coming to the media is to talk about how government policy is affecting their business, how an NPC is doing this, how that is doing that, as if is you know, but they don't look talk about the other aspect that will give confidence to the public about what their members are doing. Like the issue of uh, pumping air, it has been regular. No filling station that you go today in Nigeria, across Nigeria that they don't pump air into your car uh, uh, tank. They do that. And again, it's not just that alone. Also, the aspect of the fixing of their of their of their what meter. they call it, their meter, they fix it. A situation whereby you go for a one liter fuel. By the time you measure that one liter fuel with the reef uh, measuring uh, uh, material, you discover that they have they have undercut your your fuel. And most times when federal government agencies or tax force go to all the filling stations to go and measure those things. They discover that their meters have been tampered with. They don't give the right measurement, they don't give the right rate, or they don't give even the right uh, product to people who, supposed to, who are paid for it. So those challenges are very, 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 very threatening to customer relationship with Ipman as well as outlet. But for me, Ipman must come out clean and also ensure that their customer get the best, their members are, are, are adhering to the best practices and best standard in the oil and gas sector. Now, going to the issue of setting up tax forces by the federal government, we know that most time when government set up tax force, it will unravel some of the challenges. But for the National Assembly, when they unravel the challenges, when they discover the problem, it is only resolutions. And those resolutions, are most times, is not binding on the executive. It's not even binding on IPMA. If a National Assembly should come out with a resolution today that, I mean, indict IPMA, and they say IPMA, this and that should be done to them, it's not binding on them. The National Assembly doesn't have that the extra power like the executive that now usher the police to go and arrest somebody or close down they don't have that power so resolution could be very encouraging but it doesn't have that force of enforcement to correct what has been discovered to be wrong but what we need to say is that for each of the group that are involved the ipman and the nigerian federal government particularly downstream sector they must put in place a strategic measure that will sanction people not just closing down their filling station you can also put them blacklist them you can name them you can name filling stations that we have been experiencing pumping of air into people's uh, tank. We can begin to name them, shame them, because that will go a long way to correct people. Although Nigerians on their own have taken part to know that. If you are going to any area and you see a political filling say, I don't go there, don't go and buy for it. You say, why? You say, that place, they have tampered with their meter, or they are pumping air, or they are shortchanging people, then they are cutting your food. Nigerians are already taking that drastic measure on their own. But we also need more measures from the government in terms of naming and shaming some of these athletes that we know that are providing you know, e-services or on-delivery service to Nigeria in the oil and gas sector. Now, let's quickly breeze through more newspapers greeting our discourse this morning. And we have heard the adage that a nation is only as strong as its judiciary. But for a judiciary to be functional, there has to be a constitution guiding it. Now, the 1999 constitution, as amended, has been faulted by some Nigerians as having some lacunas that allow for the law to be circumnavigated. Now, there have been talks for a new constitution in place. 
This has gained more momentum as published by the Nigerian Tribune this morning. In its lead story beneath the masthead, it reads, The Patriots Step Up Move for New Nigerian Constitution. The Patriots Step Up Move for New Nigerian Constitution. Set Up 17-Man Advocacy Committee. Killer Heads Team to begin consultations with NAS members or the stakeholders. Re reiterates why now is the best time to have new constitution. Now, it's also at a point where mm -hmm. stage, um, the agitation for creation of new states mm. has been rumored to be fueling this mm. uh, move. Many mm. now look at it from the genuineness of mm. the move for a new constitution. Mm. Is it premised on the need for state creations and mm. a rejigging the sharing of power amongst mm. zones in Nigeria, mm. or is it indeed in a quest to strengthen the provisions of our law? All is inclusive, but uh, there's also a challenge, the challenge of a uh, new constitution that will be lacking in terms of what will, uh, what will be the, the role of the economy in that new constitution. Because for me as an economist, as a political economist, who understand some of the aspect of uh, having a new constitution, because in Nigeria, the constitution is not a major problem. The constitutional problem that we have is the implementation of the constitution to the latter in a way that it can affect and impact the life of ordinary Nigerians tomorrow and today. Ask me, if you ask ordinary Nigerians on the street, if you carry out the voice polls or Nigerians and said, do you think we need a new constitution? The area they will be telling you about that new constitution is the area of the economy. How can the ordinary people benefit from the constitution? How can the constitution guarantee the daily lives and daily income of ordinary Nigerians? That's what is missing in the constitution. Or, but the other aspect of it that has to do with the political arrangement of the country, we also know there are genuine cause for it, particularly the state creation that you're talking about. But other aspect they're also calling for in the constitution is around resources control. Resources control is the major reason. It's not about uh, state creation. How we can control our resources by each region or by a particular set of people or a particular set of ethnic group. That's what the, the, the that is what is behind this new constitution. But overall. The constitution is not a problem, but the implementer of that constitution has been a major problem to the Nigerian economy and to the Nigerian people. And what do I mean by that? Most times when you see the letters, the, law, the writings in the constitution, it specifies how things can be done. The subversion you talk about is the interest at play. The interest of the people who are going to implement the constitution. If a particular section of the constitution doesn't favor you, what do you do? You find a way to subvert it. You find a way to, un to cut it off. You find a way to wrongly implement it so that it can favor you. And that's what is happening. But the ones that will favor the generation of Nigeria, particularly ordinary people, they find a way to also keep it aside. Nobody talking about the general welfare of Nigeria, how the constitution can strengthen the general welfare of Nigeria. But what would the, the elite, particularly, are talking about is how to ensure that the Nigerian state is done in, is put in a place whereby the constitution will guarantee the survivor and the life of the elite. Because at the end of the day, when the constitution is passed, Ordinary people may not even know when it is passed. They may not even know the content of it. But then they only see things being happening. But how does those things affect their economic life? And that's what we should be thinking about. Now, the 1999 constitution as amended mm. by many scopes mm. and imaginations continues to be greeted by conversations of a military industrial complex. Mm. And question marks around the provisions of we, the people of Nigeria, mm. much like you said, in the mm. interest of the Nigerian citizens. Mm. In amending or even in constituting a new constitution, mm. how do you suppose that we beat this military industrial compass and encompass the we the people of Nigeria aspirations mm. in our new constitution? The, the we the people aspiration is how does the constitution translate into income, employment, any of we the people Nigeria? Apart from inclusivity? Definitely. And the inclusivity comes in when the leaders who are going to implement the constitution see themselves as part and parcel of we the people. There's a disconnect. Maybe because of, uh, because of the, we may not have enough time, but this is what I'm trying to bring. Now the condition is there. It's written in black and white. There should be water. There should be light. There should be good road. How much of that has been translated from the condition to Nigerians? But go to the high brand area where these people pushing for this condition, new condition are living. They live in good environment. They live in places where the roads are good. They live in places where the houses are good. They live in places where they enjoy electricity. They also enjoy a, a, a good health sector. They also have the opportunity to send their children to a better school. But what about the rest of we Nigerians? Does the constitution also translate to that? If you understand what I'm trying to bring on is that, in as much as some of us are concerned, the constitution doesn't have a problem. But rather, the problem of the constitution is implementation in a way that the generality of Nigerians, collective Nigerians, can benefit from it. 
The people pushing for this constitution are the beneficiary of this same constitution, but because the constitution right now is not catering for them, they are now calling for a new constitution. And the new constitution they are calling for is how to further bacchanize the Nigerian state in a way that it will not favor them, it could not, not become a microcosm of the control of the resources of Nigeria. That's what they are looking for. At the end of the day, they will get it. Then what will happen to the people who they are supposed to be representing through the constitution? So if we don't understand that, this 99 constitution that we are calling military doctrination, what is military doctrination? I thought we benefit so much from the military in terms of infrastructure development, but are we benefiting as much as we benefit in infrastructure under military as we are benefiting under uh, civilian government? The answer is a disconnection. There's, there's, a, there's still a big the link between the military era on infrastructure development and what we have right now. But because the implementation of the constitution are favor a selection, a set of people who believe that they must continue to enjoy what the constitution is bringing, the other set who are not benefiting are now saying, let us have a new constitution. And I bet you, by the time you have a new constitution, 99.9% of what is in this old constitution will also be translated into that new constitution. But with few changes, and what are the few changes? More states, more local government, more resources control. And that's all. Well, it is indeed an encompassing discussion as to how to capture the interest of the Nigerian citizenry under the provisions of We the People of Nigeria as enshrined in the aspirations that have been captured in the 1999 constitution as amended. Mr. Adefolarin postulates this moment that there have been some gains under the military era, as he says that uh, the military industrial complex brought about some vast improvements in our industrialization. But can we say that we've achieved as much under democratic rule or governance? Big question marks this morning. Before we move further, let's revisit the front page of the Nigerian Tribune as we look at other writer stories of interest. On the front page of the Nigerian Tribune this morning, you'd find above the masthead two stories of interest. Appeal Court reaffirms Igodalo as Edo PDP governorship candidate, says delegates lack locus to challenge primaries. Besides that, you have Tinibu removes Bichi, appoints Ajayi as new DSS DG, names Ambassador Mohammed NIA head. Now on the rider. Resident doctors begin seven-day strike. Police arrest 11 as masked men in NDLEA. Military uniform hijack multi-million naira trauma doll in Lagos. Residents of Plateau, Zamfara, Niger mining communities live in fear over constant bandit attacks. Amcon intensifies recovery efforts and lists international assets tracers. Nigeria's divestments with Owando, Mobile, any Ajib, others in accordance to PIA, says NUPRC. Now, away from the Nigerian Tribune, our next two papers are more of a human angled story. Now, the conversations as captured on their headline stories as following the FG's new policy that is set to affect the entry age of um, university intended students with the federal government moving to peg the age at 18 in terms of the entry requirements. Now, on the vanguard, the headline reads, Outrage as FG pegs age for writing Wayek at 18 years. It will draw back education, says NUT. We will go to court, says parents. We will respond later, says Wayek. We want meeting with stakeholders, says Konua. Why are parents rushing their children? Big question marks is asked by Asu. Now, the same story is captured differently on the first newspaper with the catchphrase, Aged out. Will FG's new 18-year policy for Wyatt Neko boost or hinder, ed hinder education? Will FG's new 18-year policy for Wyatt Neko boost or hinder education? Mm -hmm. It's a question we should ask across board and would also turn the question to you as, De as well. Definitely very interesting and uh, we must also look at it from the perspective of what are the age limit to start a school? But, but are you for or against the motion? Definitely, I'm um, for the for the policy. I'm so you support? Policy. Yes, I'm for the policy because of for those of us that had the opportunity of uh, going to government schools, and uh, when I never went to any private school, even down to universities and other institutions about internet. The key issue is that how did we start? How did we get to this level? You know, we we, we copy a lot of things, particularly when the privatization of schools came into being. A lot of private school came on board, and uh, I could remember that I started my education life in a private school far, far back in the early 80s. 
But later on, my parents, grandparents discovered that, okay, it's not better you go to a government school which is more equipped, more well-funded at that time. Because then, that was the beginning of private school far back in Lagos. But what I'm trying to point out, the age, there was a age arrangement of how children enter schools. But the moment we now embrace so much of these private kind of uh, schools, where we then begin to introduce a lot of scratch, uh, 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 strategy, like crutch, like uh, uh, kindergarten and the rest of them. So it changed the age means whereby children can enter school, which shows that a child of four years, five years can start a primary school. And normally, from a government perspective, in terms of the policy of government, a child could start primary school from six years. Six, seven, eight. By 12 years, you are done with your primary school. By 12 years, you're already in the secondary school. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Eight, by 18, you're already out of secondary school. That was the arrangement that the government policy encouraged. But with the introduction of private schools, private institutions, private uh, curriculum and all that's coming to be, particularly with Western, British sky style, uh, British curriculum, American curriculum, Australian curriculum, all this now break the age bracket to the point that at any point in time, a child can start school. Three, they will take you to crutch. By four, five, you're already in, a, in, in primary school. Before you are 10, you're already being prepared to be out of primary school. And you'll be wondering, you know all those things coming to be. And because of that, a lot of new generation of kids have gone through that. For those of us that were, were, were that started school in the late 80s, no, we know went through this kind of break of ages and age bracket. But those ones that now came into school from the age, from the late 90s to early 2000s, everything changed. To the point that before you know it, a child of 16 is already out of secondary school. And you'll be wondering how. Because most private schools now they don't have primary schools, primary six. You get it? They don't have primary six. What they do is that to ensure that everything that will be taught in primary six, they brought it to primary five and they teach your children. And before you know it, it they, they are out of school. Then another thing that brings this issue was that the way Amana will not have good grades in Waiyak and Neko. And with miracle centers, with uh, influences on exam officers of Neko or Waiyak, we now have schools now showing through the school advert is now the numbers of A's in white, the numbers of A's in Neko. So with that, it encourages all these age, age issues that whereby people from 15, 16, they are already out of uh, secondary school and are going to invest in. But in the long climb that we copy some of these things, how many of these age brackets do you see that break into higher institution in the US, in UK? They will just, maybe well, at the time, they will say there is a guy, uh, someone of 18 years, uh, someone of uh, 14 years that investors. And you ask, out of how many people? Because even them too, they also look at the maturity of the brains of their children before they put them into that, uh, to, to that, that particular uh, uh, pressure. Because it is pressure when you allow your child to enter university at that tender age. I was in a particular uh, center yesterday and I saw some young chap, all of them preparing to go to university. And a question was thrown at some of them about university system and uh, how they are going to cope. A lot of them were like, no, no, some of them say I'm going to private universities, some of them say I'm going to private institution and the rest of them. But the key question is that how mature are they for this particular uh, exercise they are going for? I'm not saying that they may, they may not be intelligent, they are very intelligent, but in the development climate that we copy some of these things, they are intelligent children, they are gifted children. How do they prepare them into higher institution? We need to look at that. Because we are not just to be exposing our kids because uh, the, the, the child is 14 years and very intelligent, you should go and write work. Because we know there is a miracle center happening somewhere. There is an influence on the exam officer happening somewhere. By the time the child finish work at the age of 14, he will get 6 A's, 5 B's. And you'll be wondering, did the child really meant uh, deserve that result? Or was he able to crack all those exam questions in Neko and work? Now, now, if I get you correctly, mm. The big balance that society needs to shape mm. in being able to churn out matured candidates for mm. high institution learning should not be premised only on how book smart these children are. Definitely. It's there needs to be a balance with how street smart they are. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it would come as a shocker to many, mm. but the dynamics of having some level of supervision mm. through primary school, secondary school, mm. is it, very crucial in a child's mm. formative years. Mm. At the point that they are churned into the university environment, mm. there's less supervision. Mm -hmm. And many say this is one of those rooms that gives space for most of the students to be recruited into social vices. Exactly, courtesy and the rest of them. So now at 18, mm -hmm. 18 should be the benchmark where you believe that a child would have been nurtured enough to be able to take responsibility for their actions as an adult mm. 
Is that what you also say? Not just that. I'm I'm even backing this discussion from the way back of Nigeria education policy. And that's the six three three four. And that the earlier stage that was being practiced. I'm backing it up with the the, the, the policy that we all we people like us went through before we go ourselves into university education and the rest of them. The policy has already been streamlined from age now it is from age three that children enter school from kindergarten to daycare to care whatever they call it to all manner then before you know it before the child is five years old or four, five years old, they push him into the primary school then before he's 10 11 he's out of the primary school he's in the secondary school before age 18 he's already out of secondary school he's preparing for 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 work and the rest of that but ask what is the motivation behind all this push push apart from the child is very intelligent apart from the child is bookworm there's an influence on this thing and what is that influence there is this influence on examination conduct in Nigeria, which created mark market or his own economy for it, whereby people will now go and write white neko in some places that they will get all the A's, all the B's. So we must understand there is something pushing all this age. And guess what? The poor people in our midst are not even interested in this age. Thing. Any age a child which he will go to school, either if the parent have the money, and go, but it is between the elite and the middle class in a society that are pushing for this. And most times, when you see the middle, elite and the middle class pushing for this, most times, their children don't even school here. They push them abroad to go and study. So, we are now putting pressure on the poor to now also join us in this fray. How many poor people can afford to send their children to go and write in Miracle Center? Why can they go? And they will score AAA. But it is the elite school where the middle class are sending their children that are making all this result. And by the time these children have the opportunity to face the real pressure of life, when you go to into university, it's a challenge. For those of us that study political science, that study philosophy and the rest of them, we understand what we are saying in this regard. And those that study sciences also understand what they are saying. By a child, a child that scores A in chemistry, now go and face chemistry, calculation, formulation in university. And he begin to crack his brain, begin to suffer setback in that regard. And was, after you score, you score uh, this is so so great in your wife and neko. What has happened to your brain? And at that point, the most of those children, they change their courses. For medicine, they go back to pharmacy. If they can't cope with pharmacy, they go back to social science or management courses. So what I tend to say, there's an influence, there's something that is pushing this. And I've identified two of those factors. One is the elite factors, and the middle class who also enjoy some of these things are also pushing for this. And most times, as they're pushing for this, most of their children are not the ones that study in our local or in our, in our local universities. Most of them push them out. And when they push them out, when they go outside university in outside this country, they don't go enter those universities straight. They also go through some courses before they are allowed to enter their main courses and the rest of the day. So we must be able to understand the factors that are pushing this and address that factor. If it's these miracle centers that are making people to be scoring A, 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 A and B, 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 Y, and Echo that is causing them to say, okay, any child at the age of 16 can go to university, let us address that factor. Because if that factor is not addressed, we we'll continue to have this issue. And the policy as government has pushed it, why I'm supporting it? Because far back, this policy has worked and it has prepared mature people, prepared mind. To graduate into investing and become people that have supported the country going forward. Now, it's a big question we also ask, and we hope that you too can lend your voice to the conversation. It's the question of will the federal government's new policy on 18 years for rights in WASC hinder or boost education in Nigeria? Now, in answering this question, the Nigerian Union of Teachers, NUT, has criticized the federal government's decision to ban candidates under the age of 18 from writing the West African Senior School Certificate Examination and National Examination Council, with its secretary, Dr. Mike Ene, arguing that societal changes, such as early enrollment in Crutch due to economic pressure, has made it unrealistic to restrict learning based on age. Dr. Ene pointed out that children are often being be, often begin to learn at an early age and sometimes are academically advanced before reaching the age of 18, warning that the policy could face legal challenges. Now, parents are threatening to mm -hmm. jump on the back of this publication from mm -hmm. NUT mm -hmm. and uh, take the federal government to court, mm -hmm. citing economic challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, persons look at it in terms of projections for how to cover the cost of children's education through life. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason they are able to come into money at a time when the child is three and can be enrolled in crutch mm. to reduce pressure from having to have the mother sit back at home mm -hmm. and not be able to gain f engage herself in gainful ventures that will bring money into the family mm -hmm. people are also looking at the 
tendency of taking children to daycares mm -hmm. even at this point so that the both parents can jump into the streets and, and make fend for money. the exactly. family. Do, does this make sufficient reason as to why some families would tend to want to push their children out of the home earlier than 18? That is the interest. As you know, I made mention of the middle class. This is one of the major interests of the middle class. Middle class who are trying to uh, career people who want to make sure that they are their wife and their husband are working, their child are in daycare. All of these are factors, all of these have their own disadvantage. NUT on their own part is trying as much as well to defend the interests of the union of teachers because more enrollment also mean more money is coming to the school, more, you know, a lot of things come together. It's all about the interest. Just like Ilya pointed out, it was based on the policy of the government in the 70s to the 80s that made people like us say, so, okay, this policy is very good. We can take a hold of this policy. But because of what the NUT also said, talk about changing factors across the world. But even the changing factor across the world, how many countries are also allowing this to happen in their country? The countries that were coping some of this early year school, the rest of the how do they even cope with this? Can do they have children of 14, 15 writing their national examination and the rest of them? In the US and the UK, do we have them? If we have them, let us have it. Then we also have people who go into universities with not yet mature going to the university. We need to have all this data with us. But the key question still remains that how are we going to ensure that at the end of the day, in fact, because for me, it is not that the government policy is bad on its own, or we should just support it as a whole, as I've earlier pointed out. But what is the factor behind? What is the motivation behind it? It is to go back to how the children are performing in the examination that we are pointing out, the NECO and the YEC. And if you discover the performance, if you go to all government schools, people don't make A's like I flyer, but go to all these private schools that make, you may, they make it. The children make those results. And you now give you the reason why this could be something like more like an elite, elite and a middle class policy that they just want this to not to happen. But for the poor people, the poor Nigerians who are sending their children to, to government school, how many of them have the money to send children to crutch? The poor people wait for their child to be up to five to six years before they send them to primary school. You get it? Then they move to secondary school. That is the one that have the money to sell it. And the one that go to secondary school, if the GSS3, they will end. They end there and go and learn trade. If the SS3, they end, they write their wife or write their neko and go. But the elite and the middle class will know that this policy is against them entirely because they want their children to quickly finish school and go for good grades and start work. But the other side of the NUT issue is that because of age of parents, so that children can quickly learn, get a job, and be able to come out and support their parents. But if you still put this beside the poor people, how many poor people are hoping their children will go through all this and come and help them? But because they reach the elite already know that by the time their children are 21, they can push them to NNPC, they can push them to CBN, they can push them to all these choice government agencies at the age of 21, 22, 23. Then what happened to the poor? Well, it's a big question mark with the economy being on the score. That's one of the reasons why most families, parents and guardians resort to sending their children to tertiary educational institutions before the clock the age of 18. Now, speaking further on the subject, the Minister of Education, Professor Mami, uh, Tahir Maman, uh, also spoke to the management of ASU through its president, Professor Emmanuel Sodeke, saying that this policy is not new and owing to the 6334 policy for education as mandated that come the year 2025, this policy would be followed to the latter as the federal government would move to restrict any aspiring students for tertiary education who have not clocked 18 from seating for WASC. Now, this is one of those uh, key topics of discussion. I'll be looking to get feedback from you as well as you take to social media to react to this conversation. Now, and in wrapping up this conversation on the local scenes, we'll just look at the headline story on the business day, and then we'll take a quick commercial break. Now, greeting the front page on the Business Day newspaper this morning, the last newspaper we'll be looking at. The Business Day mirrors in the stock market. And uh, the lead story reads, Stock deals jump 44% on bank recapitalization. Stock deals jump 44% on bank's recapitalization. There are two stories uh, besides that. Fed's rate cut seen given battered Naira breather. Fed's rate cut seen given battered Naira breather. And Amcon intensifies assets recovery and lists international traces. Now, this is uh, about the size of our local newspaper review. We'll take a quick commercial break, and when we return, we'll have more discussions as it concerns the surge of fake certificates with certificates meals thriving in the likes of Bene, 
Republic and Togo. And the move by the federal government that has now said that only three accredited universities in Togo and five in Bene have been approved for Nigerian students who are in quest of procuring higher education learning to visit. Others are considered not savvy or into an investigative report, investigative report that's published by a Nigerian journalist. Stay with us.